we thank God for another opportunity to listen to his word and share it among ourselves during this period of partial lockdown. Today we want to pick a passage from John chapter 3 from verse 1 to 15. But before I read it, let us have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you that even in the midst of the menace of coronavirus, you are still with us and you have given us the opportunity to continue sharing your word together. We pray that through your word you will speak to us, that we shall hear you speak to us in tones that we can understand. We submit ourselves to you. Lord, wherever we lack, let your word grant us the grace to correct so we can get into partnership with you as you want and fulfill the things that you have set for our lives. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. Now, let me read the passage that we are going to discuss. John chapter 3 from verse 1 to 15. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can, do, can perform the miracles and the signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked, Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it's coming from or where it is going. So it is with, the, with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus and do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Amen. Today, the topic that we want to discuss is riding the religious merry-go-round. Riding the religious merry-go-round. A merry-go-round is a revolving playing ground machine 
that people ride on. Figuratively, it can also be used to describe a busy round of activity. What needs to be noted here is that the machine can be made to revolve at a speed that excites those riding on it. But no matter the speed, the riders are only going in circles and are at the same point. They go nowhere. This is to help us understand the topic a bit. Now let's look at Nicodemus. This was, was a man who got attracted to Jesus because of the miracles he did, as we read in verse 2. He might have come to see the Lord Jesus Christ at night, both to find some cover from the prying eyes of the Jewish public and for him to have enough time with him, or perhaps either one of them. Nicodemus was a highly respected personality in the Jewish society. A Pharisee who lived by the strictest religious rules and ensured that others did same. He was of the scholarly Jewish class. It looks like he was one Pharisee who was sincere in his quest for religious truth. Perhaps of high moral character and had a deep religious hunger. Nicodemus was busy living to fulfill the law of the fathers, trying hard to obey all the dogmas and rituals of Judaism strictly ensuring that others obeyed the laws of the fathers, thinking that these drew him closer to God. He thought that he had earned a plus, plus, plus in divine approval, but he was in fact going in circles. The excitement in his zeal made him think he'd gone far ahead of the publicans and the tax collectors. However, his discussion with the Lord Jesus portrays Nicodemus as one having a profound spiritual blindness. He was deeply religious, zealously committed to practicing the religion of the fathers, but alas, he was spiritually empty and barren like many of us who may be empty religionists like him. Now let's look at his encounter with the Lord Jesus. Notably, Nicodemus poses his question in the form of a flat statement of confession. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Perhaps the Jewish religious leadership had already been discussing and debating on who this Jesus was. Nicodemus, by his sincere nature, could not argue and propose on speculation. He took it upon himself to draw the truth from Jesus' own mouth. So we do understand his statement of confession which betrayed his spiritual barrenness and his need. A lesson I want us to learn from this is that in whatever camouflage we come or we approach the Lord Jesus Christ, he sees our dirty and tattered undercloth and he is merciful and loving enough to rip it off us if we are willing and give us his robe of righteousness. Nicodemus went to seek the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ, but he ended up knowing the truth about himself. He was gleefully riding a religious merry-go-round 
He had been busy for nothing. He needed to be born again, as the Lord Jesus Christ told him in verse 3. Now, what is this new birth that the Lord Jesus Christ was proposing to Nicodemus? Let's look at it. When this highly educated religious leader was being enlightened on spiritual birth, his mind was on a physical birth. Permit me to liken it to what is happening today. When you talk with people about being born again, they often discuss their family's religious heritage, their church membership, having been baptized and confirmed, their involvement in religious ceremonies and church activities, and so on and so forth. Now, to be born again is to be born of the Spirit. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ told Nicodemus. Just as there are two parents for physical birth, let me also say that there are two parents for spiritual birth. The Spirit of God, as the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 3, verse 5, and the Word of God, as in James chapter 1, verse 18, and 1 Peter chapter 1, 23 to 30, 25. Now let me read what James chapter 1, verse 18 says. For he chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, 23 to 25, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God and when the sinner believes, imparts the life of God into him or her. The water that our Lord Jesus Christ mentioned here does not refer to water baptism. The new birth does not begin with water baptism. In fact, in the New Testament, baptism is referred to as death and resurrection with Christ. Salvation or the new birth comes through faith in Jesus Christ, as Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 say, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. The evidence of salvation is the witness of the Spirit within. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 to 11. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Now let's look at the nature of the new birth. There are a few things I want us to learn about the nature of the new birth. The first one is that our physical birth came about with much physical and emotional travail on the part of our parents we are born out of travail on the part of our parents. So also is the spiritual birth. Our Savior Jesus had to travail on the cross so that we can become members of the family of God, as Isaiah 53 verse 11 says. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will here bear their iniquities, and he will bear 
their iniquities. And so if we also want to lead others to Christ, we have to travail in prayer for them. Just as the Apostle Paul did in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, he travailed in prayer for the Galatian Christians. And so we don't just pick our Bible and say we are going to witness to others without having prayed for them. We need to travail in prayer for the people we want the Lord Jesus Christ to save. Now the second thing I want us to learn about the nature of the new birth is that as the child inherits the nature of the parents, so does the child of God inherit the nature of God. In the new birth, we become partakers of the divine nature, as 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 tells us. Nature also determines appetite, which explains why the Christian has an appetite for the things of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, like newborn babies, crave the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. A person who has undergone the new birth has no desire to go back to the foul things of the world that once appealed to him. Also in 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 20 to 22 but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating or doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. The newborn Christian feeds on the word of God and grows into spiritual maturity as Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11, verse 11 to 14 says we have much to say about this but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn in fact though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Is not acquainted about the teaching of righteousness. So we need to feed on the word of God and grow into spiritual maturity. Now the next thing I want us to learn about the nature of the new birth is that this birth involves life just as general birth involves life. Even if the baby is born and spends just one week on earth, that has been life. And so spiritual birth also involves God's life. The person who has not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ does not have God's life, what we refer to as eternal life or abundant life. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. The only way to enter God's life is through the new birth. As we read from John chapter 1 verses 11 to 13. He came so that to that which was his own but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children 
of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human design or decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The next one is birth involves a future. And we are born again to a living hope. Any person who has experienced the new birth has a new hope, as 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When we are born again into God's family, our sins are forgiven and forgotten, and we have a bright future with a living hope. What then shall we say to this? The Lord Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus to his surprise, you must be born again. Nicodemus was a born Jew. He was part of God's covenant people. He wasn't a Gentile. His life was exemplary. He was a faithful Pharisee. He could well understand it if Jesus told a Roman or a Samaritan that he needed to be born again, but not a Jew. The Lord needed to tell Nicodemus this because Nicodemus had been riding gleefully on the deceptive religious merry-go-round. What about you? Maybe you also need to be born again. It is dangerous to continue riding on the blissful religious merry-go-round. May the Lord grant us the grace to see as he tried to explain to the Nicodemus so that we will jump off this religious merry-go-round and have an encounter with him so he would bring the necessary transformation into our lives.